what's up guys welcome back to the ufc arena as you can see from the title the name of this series is called hindsight so basically after any big pay-per-view event i'm gonna look back at the card in hindsight because hindsight is 2020 and i'm gonna see the narratives that they had coming into the fight see what held true see what was false and now i'm gonna go through all the fights and we're gonna look back in hindsight we're not gonna spend too much time on all of them but i'll try my best to touch on something that we learned in each of them Starting off with the first fight, Jillian Robertson versus Priscilla Cachoeira. Well, what did we learn in this fight? Priscilla Cachoeira is a very dirty fighter. This lady tried to gouge out Jillian Robertson's eyes blatantly, not once, but twice. That is a very dirty move. I know she was in the middle of a choke, I know she was panicking, but I'm sorry, there's just no excuse for that. You're in control of your body, and it was clearly intentional. That's dirty. I've never seen anyone do that that blatantly twice. Honestly, I feel like there's no place for that in the UFC, and I would not be shedding any tears if she was not here anymore. Next up, we had Randy Costa versus Tony Kelly. And going into this fight, Tony Kelly said, Randy Costa has quit in him. And there was this narrative attached to Randy Costa that he's a great fighter, explosive, a bit of a gunslinger, but he gets tired. And looking back on the fight now, all those things turned out to be true. Tony Kelly was right. He was able to break Costa. He was able to make him quit. And Randy Costa did get tired next up ryan hall versus Derek miller now this was an interesting one what did this one tell us in hindsight well for one ryan hall is an awkward grappling genius right he's a mastermind on the ground and he just finds ways to tie you up and no matter where he is he always seems to find your ankles like fighting this man is like fighting a pest however I will say that Mina looked like he was lacking a little bit of fight IQ in this fight because he was willingly engaging on the ground with Ryan Hall. I understand that he has confidence in his own grappling abilities but even his own coach was telling him what are you doing get up and he had several opportunities to get up in rounds one and two and he chose to stay on the ground because i guess he felt like he was having success and eventually that success became his downfall because hall found a way to reverse the position get a dominant position of his own and win the fight that way so hall grappling genius Mina, good fighter, but mm, some questionable decisions. Next up, we had Aaron Blanchfield versus Miranda Maverick. And what did I learn? I learned that Erin Blanchfield has a little bit of Khabib in her. She was controlling those grappling exchanges at will, and the kind of dominance that she had reminded me of Khabib. Miranda Maverick is a good fighter, and you can see she's a strong fighter as well. However, she was not able to outgrapple Blanchfield. Blanchfield is really young. She's 22 years old and she already has her eyes on the title, which is Valentina Shevchenko. She said herself she needs to get better. So you can see that's what she's aiming for. She has a long way to go from Valentina, but very promising prospect. Next fight, Andrew Muniz versus Eric Anders. So coming into this fight, Andrew Muniz coming off of that victory over Jackery where he broke Jackery's hand showed everyone that he's definitely a grappling threat and not to be messed with and in this fight that held true he was able to get Eric Anders down and submit him no problem this guy is the real deal he's a problem in this division because of how big and strong he is you better stay on the feet with this guy whoever is fighting this guy do not go to the ground i repeat do not go to the ground might be easier said than done with that power blast double that he hit anders with but yes after seeing this hindsight tells me Muniz is the real deal Next up, Tai Tuivasa versus Augusto Sakai. What this fight showed me is that Tai Tuivasa has been improving, he's been working on his craft and he's not just a brawler anymore, he's definitely becoming more technical and he's making smarter decisions in the octagon. This was a beautiful knockout, a sustained combination to get the job done and I think it is time for him to start fighting contenders again. He's on quite a knockout streak so good for him and the shoey is definitely making him more and more famous he has fans all in the crowd when bear on themselves spilling it all over the place trying to do a shoey and yes i still think it's disgusting <laughs> 
Anyway, next we had Dominic Cruz versus Pedro Munoz. In hindsight, what did we learn? Dominic Cruz still got it. This man is still very good. He's still very fast. He's not a shell of himself. He's a good fighter and he has a lot left in the tank. Also, I said in my prediction video that Pedro Munoz is the kind of guy that Dominic Cruz beats. He is the kind of guy that Dominic Cruz is accustomed to fighting. And after listening to Cruz talk after the fight, he validated what I said that Pedro Munoz is the kind of fighter he used to meet all the time, even going back to his WEC days, and it showed, which is why some people would say this looked like vintage Cruz. And he also explained that he might not have looked as good in the Casey Kenny fight but that is because he was fighting a softball and he had to adjust everything. He did not look as fluid or as good as he might have expected him to look. Before this fight people were wondering if Cruz could still go. The answer is yes he can. He can even fight for a title soon. Not saying he's gonna win though. Josh Emmett vs Dan Ige. This fight didn't really tell me anything, it was pretty much what I expected. They're both good fighters, but I think they're gatekeepers at best. And my guy, Sean O'Malley vs. Howlian Piper. This just reinforced the fact that O'Malley is a star. Did you hear the pop when O'Malley was coming out? People pay attention to this guy, whether it's to cheer him, whether it's to boo him, whether it's to see him win or to see him lose, people want to see this guy and he knows it. He has built that brand for himself and it showed on that night. He's a star and I think we also saw that he's ready for the top of the division because these lower level guys, he's just beating the crap out of them. He's finishing them in the first round. So Sean O'Malley is for real, he's ranked now finally so his next opponent I assume is going to be a ranked person. Next up Cody Garbrandt vs Kai Kara France. What do we learn about this one? We now know that Kai has the power to finish Cody and finish him in devastating fashion. Some people may say that we see Cody has no chin at flyweight as well. However, I would not go that far because I think that the shots that Kai landed on Cody would knock out almost any flyweight or any bantamweight. He landed clean, powerful shots, beautiful combinations. Looking back, we could also see that Gabran had some misplaced confidence. He was definitely brushing off Kai. You could see from the way he was acting that he thought that he would be able to run through Kai or that Kai wasn't that much of a threat to him. Kai said so himself in his interviews afterwards. And we also saw that Adesanya and their team, they had a lot of faith and confidence in Kai and they knew that he had the ability to win that fight. Adesanya actually made a bet on Kai to win the fight and he won big. So now we have Kai who's asking for a title shot, but I think he needs one more fight and I saw Asuka Askarov who's ranked above him. He's offering to fight Kai to see who the true number one contender is and I say 100% do that fight, that is the fight to make, book it, let's go. Now the next fight was Jeff Neal vs Santiago Ponzinibbio. What did this one tell me? It told me that Ponzinibbio is still great but he's not the guy he was before all the injuries and before all the time off. He's high level but I don't think he's quite there because this performance even though Jeff Neal won I was not that impressed with Jeff Neal and I just feel like prime Santiago Ponzinibbio would have been able to win this fight. Now we get to the biggest upset of the nine and also the fight that looking back has taught me the most. The first thing I learned from this fight is looks can be deceiving because Nunes looked like she was in the best shape of her life. She had visible abs. She was in great shape. She looked healthy. She looked good. She looked ready to go. When you hear her talk, she was just as confident as ever. But when you see her in the fight and when you see how things played out, you realize that maybe things weren't as good as they seemed from the outside looking in. After hearing Nunes talk in her post fight interview, she definitely alluded to the fact that she was probably battling some injuries and they surfaced in the fights. She said things that she thought were fixed, they apparently weren't. In addition to that, Juliana Pena talked the talk and walked the walk. She was fearless before the fight and she was fearless in the fight. She had a chin, she had a heart, she was willing to take a shot to give one. Chael Sonnen often says something very interesting that I like. He says, 
As a fighter, if you find yourself in a fight that is more difficult than you anticipated, it could really affect you mentally. And I think that is what happened in this fight. You can see that Nunes was having a hard time. She is so accustomed to hitting girls and them backing off but when she would hit juliana pena she would not back off she would keep coming forward she did not seem to be hurting pena the way she was accustomed to hurting girls with her striking not only that she was getting hit a lot more than she's accustomed getting hit in her fights if you've seen adesanya's reaction to this fight he said something he said she's panic striking she's panic striking and that is something that I also saw in the fight because all technique went out the window, all game plan went out the window. Nunes striking just seemed to be get off for me, leave me alone, I don't like this. And why did she get tired? Because she was not able to fight her fight, she was not fighting at her pace, she was putting all her power in almost everything she threw and she could not sustain it. Things were harder than she thought it would be. So hindsight has now shown us that Amanda Nunes may still have some underlying cardio issues they're not completely gone it's just that she has been able to fight at her own pace for the most part but if she's not if she's taken out of that and forced to fight at her opponent's pace those issues still persist juliana pena outstruck amanda nunes in this fight but looking back at her striking i can guarantee you she will never outstrike shevchenko the way she did nunes there she was sloppy her striking was not pretty she was literally throwing with her eyes closed on more than one occasion and just swinging she was just throwing wild and that ain't gonna fly against shevchenko i've said this many times and other people have also said this many times amanda nunes is the goat okay no debate there however valentina shevchenko is the most skilled fighter I also think there's no debate there. Juliana Pena said she doesn't mind a rematch with Chepchenko. She will lose. Now, the last fight on the card, the main event, Charles Oliveira versus Dustin Poirier. What do we see? Well, going into the fight, there was a the narrative that Charles is a quitter. Of course, the main person who said that was Justin Gaethje. And people took it and ran with it. That Dustin Poirier had more dog in him, better cardio, and that he'd win in the later rounds. I was picking Dustin Poirier for this fight, but I never doubted that Oliveira could win. I thought that Dustin Poirier would be able to survive and have his way in the later rounds. But boy, was I wrong. I did not anticipate the forward pressure that Oliveira would fight with, and I also did not anticipate the chin and toughness of Charles Oliveira. If there's anything that Oliveira's last two fights against Chandler and against Poirier have shown us, it is that he's a different fighter now. He's not looking for a way out, he's not playing it safe, he's not quitting, he is in there. You can hit him how much you want, he even said it after, he's gonna come forward and you can see that. It is not very often that you drop a fighter multiple times and you still haven't earned his respect like he's still walking you down like he doesn't care. Dustin Poirier tried to play it safe, he tried to implement lessons from the Khabib fight, give up the round rather than lose the fight, but it did not matter. Charles Oliveira showed his grappling is on another level. He does not even need to take you down to submit you. He's done this more than once where he submitted people on the feet. One thing I will mention though is Charles Oliveira holding the glove in the second round which led to the takedown and almost a full round of ground control. There is a possibility and there is an argument here to be made that if this does not happen, Dustin Poirier has a much better chance of winning this fight because in the first round, we saw Dustin was having his way in the striking. If he was able to stay on the feet in the second round, who knows what would have happened. Maybe he would have dropped Charles two more times and actually finished him. Who knows. But yes guys, that's the end of this video. If you enjoy my content, leave a like down below. Leave a comment. Let me hear your thoughts. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Hit that notification bell so you know every time I drop a new video. Subscribe. We're on the road to 400 subs, so happy boy out. We have a fight night card coming up this Saturday. So I'll talk about a few of those fights. So look out for that video. And I'll see you all in the next one.